Hi, and welcome to this roundup of historical romance books with a duke in the title. This is just going to be volume one because there are so many books that I've read with the word duke in the title because, you know, dukes sell books. And so this is just volume one. Stay tuned for more of them. I'm Olivia, your favorite resource for book recommendations. You can easily screenshot and you're watching Random Olive Reads. Desert Island Duke by Kate Bateman is a novella length story that's part of the Ruthless Rivals series. Caroline and Max get stranded together alone on an island when their ship crash crashes. Not to worry too much, they've spotted the rest of her family in the distance at a neighboring island. Everyone is totally fine. Carol and Max have had a bantering relationship up to this point with Max being friends with Carol's brother. Max has seemingly lost his memory, so Caro decides to tease him by saying that he's a groom rather than the duke that he actually is. We find out pretty early that Max is faking his amnesia and knows exactly who he is, and he's using this opportunity to flirt with Caro, who he wants to court and marry. It's a pretty quick read with pretty low angst. One Duke Down by Anna Bennett is book two of the Rogues to Lovers series. We have Fisherman's Daughter Poppy who discovers an injured man washed up on shore who claims to be a Duke. She trades him shelter for money while he figures out who might have attacked him. These two have instant rapport and chemistry with each other with a lot of easy teasing and flirting. However, there is Poppy's poor history with members of the nobility and the Duke Keen actually turning out to be a Duke. Plus, we have drama with Poppy's wayward brother and the mystery of Keen's assault. Despite all of these obstacles, Poppy and Keen are sure of each other's character and integrity, and never once doubt the other person. This was a delightfully enjoyable read. What's a Duke Got to Do With It by Christina Britton is book two of the Sinful Spinsters series. We start with a tragic prologue for Katrina, who is the sister of a baronet. She's enjoying her first flirtatious season. Just as it seems like her flirtation with a young lord might be headed somewhere, he's called away from a ball unexpectedly. What follows is a different lord sneaking into her window being un uninvited. She gets caught by her brother and there's some sort of imminent scandal, even though she didn't do anything wrong. Years later, Katrina is living as a companion to a stern dowager viscountess. And that idiot lord has come back to climb into her window again. This time he falls to his death, causing even more scandal for Katrina. Meanwhile, Sebastian, the man who was called away from that last ball, has been digging his way out of his father's debts and is on the cusp of marrying a we wealthy heiress. He just needs to fulfill one last assignment for her father, which is to distract the brother from marrying an actress. Sebastian and his charge find themselves hosted by the Dowager Viscountess. Sebastian and Katrina have the opportunity to meet again, reconnect, even though both of their circumstances have changed. And for very practical reasons, they don't have a future together. It was still fun to read how much Sebastian has been pining for Katrina after all these years and how Katrina's odd group of friends rally behind her. And the matchmaking dowager is also one of the best characters of the series. The Duke's Secret Cinderella by Eva Devon is book three of the Never a Wallflower series. While this book is part of a series, it reads completely standalone with no apparent connection to the other books. This one starts off a lot like the movie Ever After, which is the Cinderella movie retelling from 1998 starring Drew Barrymore and one of my favorite movies ever. Charlotte is the servant of the house who schemes with her beloved stepsister to dress nicely and go down to the prison to free her servant. While there, she meets Rafe, a duke whose mother has just decreed that he should marry. They part ways before she can tell him her name, but when he comes to her house later to call on her stepsister, she somehow gets introduced as a lady and cousin. 
Rafe is smitten with Charlotte the whole way through and is determined to make her his duchess, but she's resistant because of the punishments she will face from her stepfather if she has seemingly usurped her stepsister's place. This book was delightful with how straightforward Rafe is with his feelings and how his mother and grandmother are completely supportive. It's a nice contrast to how evil and scheming Charlotte's stepfather is. How Not to Marry a Duke by Tina Gabrielle is book two of the Daring Ladies series. So we have our Duke who's in the country working on his inventions. Uh, The Duke of Warwick, known to his sweet godmother as Daniel, is not your typical Duke. He is socially inept and awkward and focuses mostly on his passion for science and technology. While he is hiding in the country to escape the bustle of town and the matchmaking efforts of his godmother, he meets his new neighbor Adeline, who has her own problems. Adeline is the banished half-sister of an earl who is in the country to work as the village healer. However, her brother has tried to arrange her marriage to a moneylender to pay off his debts. When Warwick hears the argument between Adeline and her brother, he steps in and says that she can't marry another person because they're already courting. We start a fake courtship here so that Warwick can avoid his godmother's pressures to get married and so that Adeline can avoid her brother's arranged betrothal. Both characters are preoccupied with their own individual goals and they're not looking to get married, especially not to each other. Of course, as they spend more time with each other, they learn to appreciate the other person's strengths even those things that are typically dismissed by society. I especially loved how Warwick was supportive of Adeline's work as a healer. The romance built up slowly in this book, but the respect that they had each ho- for each other was a strong foundation for their partnership. Yours Truly the Duke by Amelia Gray is book one of the Say I Do series. We start here with one of the silliest reasons for a marriage of convenience, which is inheritance. Our Duke Wyatt has just been informed that he needs to get married within seven days to keep the property that his grandmother left for him. Not to worry, though, his solicitor has already found him a bride. Frederica is in a custody battle with her cousin over the guardianship of her sister's orphaned children and needs a husband to bolster her cause. When the Duke shows up at her house to offer marriage, she is completely stunned and would rather have had more time to consider a proposal, but they're on a time crunch, so she accepts. Along the way, we find that Frederica is the strict caregiver and expecting proper behavior from the children, but mostly so that she doesn't get the kids taken away from her, and Wyatt is the one who wants to see the kids rambunctiously playing. These two are constantly bickering from their opposing views on child rearing, plus misinterpreting each other's words anytime they're speaking. It was a fun book to read, and I'll definitely be reading more from this author. Never Seduce a Duke by Vivian Lorette is book five of the Mating Habits of Scoundrel series. This one makes more sense if you read book three of the series, The Wrong Marquess, but totally makes sense on its own as well. Meg is the younger sister of the main character of book three, and she's traveling on holiday with the spinsterly aunts of her new sister-in-law. After having her heart broken, Meg is intent on having a grand holiday and possibly flirtation before returning to her brother's home to stay a spinster. However, those meddlesome aunts are at their recipe stealing antics and somehow get entangled with a surly hermit of a duke lucian his family relic a recipe book covered in jewels and myths has disappeared the same time that meg is caught trespassing in his home so he chases her across her european vacation to find the book lucian seems to think that meg is the seductive and mysterious lady avalon known to be a thief while Meg, who has been fresh-faced and overlooked by gentlemen forever, is flattered by his attentions. The banter and flirtation and fighting goes on for half the book, which is a little bit tedious to read sometimes, with them misunderstanding each other and him just being a stubborn, stoic, scientific asshole. When they finally come together and perhaps the truth may be uncovered, there's another set of miscommunications that keeps them separated and 
from Lucian never knowing Meg's real name or identity. And as the, the back of the book alludes to, Meg ends up pregnant from the encounter. Though the front half of the book moved slowly and kind of tediously, the pace picks up in the back half of the book with a gasp-worthy time jump, and we do ultimately find out the identity of Lady Avalon. Four Weddings and a Duke by Michelle McLean is a standalone novel. We have a socially awkward duke with a socially awkward wallflower who he turns into his duchess. Alex, the second son of a duke, never expected to inherit and would rather be working on his botany experiments instead. However, he knows that he will have to pick between three sisters to fulfill the art agreement that his father made with their father. Lavinia is the often overlooked and shy middle sister who would rather read and hide behind ponded plants than dance. When Alex comes to call on the sisters, he chooses Lavinia as his bride instead of the other, more socially outgoing sisters. From there, Lavinia is doing her best to arrange their social calendar for the Duke's benefit, while Alex is wondering why he's being dragged to all of these events when he should be working. Add in a possibly nefarious rival and work partner who disparages Alex for spending time with his new wife, and we have our befuddled Duke doing and saying all the wrong things. I was most definitely feeling Lavinia's heartbreak throughout this book as she's trying so hard to be a good wife and duchess to Alex, but they're just like not talking to each other to figure out what those common goals should be. I really did enjoy this book and I love this kind of quick and instant decision to get married. Bed Me Duke by Felicity Niven is book one of the Bed Me Books series. We start in on the action here with our countess in her own right, Helen, asking Jack for lessons in seduction so that she can somehow convince the new duke to marry her. We found out pretty quickly that the plain old Jack is really is the new duke, but he has been a commoner in disguise as he gets a lay of the land. Then we rewind to three weeks prior when Jack finds out that he's inherited after his cousin dies. We learned a little bit more about his backstory and why he doesn't trust women so much. We love the character build of Jack and you can kind of understand why he is the way he is. When he goes to visit the new estate in Scotland, he uses his common name and doesn't let anyone know he's the Duke so that people don't treat him differently. There, he meets Helen, the neighboring countess, while she's struggling with some sheep and taking her care of her own business. Helen has had her own struggles with an impoverished estate. She thinks that getting married to the new Duke will solve all of her financial problems. She's also very unsure of herself as a woman, and she thinks she has a lot of lack of sensual appeal, even though she is a very strong and effective leader. Helen is loud and brash and forthright, and somehow all of these things very much appeal to Jack, who is like the most attractive man that Helen has ever seen. We get to see Helen and Jack slowly fall in love, but they can't really commit to each other or do anything about it. Helen's still holding out for the Duke and Jack feels horribly guilty for deceiving Helen about his identity. It's a horrible muddle that will keep you reading just to figure out how it all resolves. Stealing the Duke by Lexi Post is book one of the Marrying a Mabry series. Loosely modeled after the March family of Little Women by Louisa May Alcott, we start the series with Joanna, who is in the process of stealing a book from an arrogant and pretentious Duke. Unfortunately, that book has a false cover, and she doesn't realize that she has actually stolen a book of scandalous illustrations and tutorials. When James finds out that his book has gone missing, he suspects Joanna of the crime. These two banter and debate and talk around the stolen book, but Joanna thinks that he suspects her of stealing it. There's a, lot, there's a lot of discussion about the roles of women and what constitutes a good match in society with Joanna enlightening James on the intellect and goals of women. Add in James's dislike for society, the perfect lady half-heartedly courting, and his all-too-knowing aunt, plus a cousin making her debut, we have a lot of moving pieces in the story. The flirtatious banter was great, even though both characters don't realize that they're flirting or genuinely enjoying each other's company. 
this was an enjoyable book, and I'm definitely le- looking forward to reading more about the rest of the Mabry clan. The Duke Gets Even by Joanna Shoup is book four of the Fifth Avenue Rebel series, and it takes place in Gilded Age, New York. This one may- actually makes the most sense if you've read the other three books of the series, because there have been hints of an uneasy relationship between Nellie and the Duke of Lockwood. Nellie is everyone's scandalous best friend with knowledge about affairs and men. Meanwhile, the destitute Duke of Lockwood needs an American heiress to marry for money. We go back to the beginning of the Newport house party from book one and two, where Lockwood and Nellie meet as strangers at the beach at midnight. And after some flirting and kissing, they plan for a tryst the next day. However, when Lockwood shows up at the house party the next day and is introduced to all the guests, he and Nellie realize that any sort of connection is impossible and over. We meet again in six months after Nellie's other friends are all settled down and Nellie is feeling listless and aimless since all of her friends are married and they don't really need her anymore. Plus, Lockwood is still looking for a docile and wealthy bride. What starts out as angry flirting turns into an angry affair with neither of them wanting to engage their emotions and their hearts. Lockwood has some secrets of his own with a health condition, plus Nellie is unwilling to risk her emotions after her mother died at a young age. An important side story here is Nellie's work in educating women about contraception and taking control of their reproductive rights. I appreciated seeing this play out in a historical setting and seeing Nellie's championing of women's education on the subject. Surrendering to the Duke by Stevie Sparks is book one of the Lords of Desire series. This actually takes place in in the interwar era of England, which is just after World War I. Content warnings galore on this one for violence, post-war substance abuse, and a history of sexual assault. We have a Duke's widow, Emmeline, living with her late husband's family with her young daughter, and she has had a history of abuse at the hand of her uncle who raised her after she was orphaned at the age of three. Michael, her late husband's younger brother, and now the Duke, is back at home after completing his war-related duties after the Great War. His mother suggests that he marries Emmeline to provide her with more children and provide the dukedom with an heir. Of course, Michael had been in love with Emmeline since he first saw her, but has had extreme guilt out over coveting his brother's wife. These two embark on a courtship of convenience with the possible goal of marriage, but both have secrets and traumas that may prevent them from living happily ever after. There is loads of drama in this book, and there's all sorts of angst and some sort of connection with the village baker that we see revealed ultimately at the end of the book. This one was an excellent read. So I hope you enjoyed the roundup of these dozen dukes. Thank you so much for watching this video. Keep an eye out on volume two eventually. Links to all of these books are in the description box. Like and subscribe so you don't miss future videos. And you can follow me on Instagram at randomolive.